Hey everyone, Mike Fleming with Echo 7 Foxtrot, Private Investigations, and Secrets True Crime Podcast. Uh, coming to you today to talk about fire, fire mechanics, and look at one of the theories that came about early on in the investigation of uh, Eric Cates and Gypsy's death. Um, and it's a theory that we've been hearing with more and more frequency um, lately as we investigate the case and bring information to you through the podcast. Um, so bear with me a little bit. I'm sitting in a car. You're probably wondering why. Um, thinking maybe you tuned into the wrong channel. Um, the check engine light's coming on on this. Uh, so I wanted to put the computer on it and see what's going on. And uh, it's telling me the system is too lean. Um, I happen to know what that means and I actually know what's causing it. Um, but that's a, a really good place to start this video. Um, what does that mean? Too lean. We've heard that, that phrase most people have that something's too lean to burn, maybe too rich to burn. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and how that applies to the idea that Eric may have accidentally set his truck on fire. Um, and and whether or not that really makes sense um, scientifically. So we're going to talk about that today um, as we talk about lean mixtures, rich mixtures, and basically just how does fire work. All right, for combustion to occur, you need really two things. To start combustion, you need three things. Um, the two critical things are fuel and air, or oxygen, um, which can be provided by air or you can have some other chemical process going on like oxidation that's providing oxygen uh, to, to allow the combustion to continue. Um, to get it started, in addition to those two things, you need a, a source of ignition. Um, if you have combustion going on, like what I have here with this small candle burning, then you don't need the ignition source anymore. It keeps itself going until it runs out of one of those two things. If I run out of fuel, the fire goes out. The candle's empty, the fire will go out. If you remove the air or the oxygen that it's using that's keeping the fire going, then the fire will also go out. And you've probably done this with your kids or in science back in elementary school or something. If I put a jar over this candle, Eventually that flame's going to go out. See, it went out. The flame consumed the oxygen that was trapped under the jar, and as soon as there was no more oxygen, the fire went out. So those are the critical things that you need for combustion. What that fire triangle, the fuel, the air, and the ignition source, what that doesn't tell you is that you also have to have the right mixture, the right ratio of fuel and air. Um, and that ratio changes depending on what the fuel is. Um, so in the case of my car, um, I'm getting the error code that it's too lean to burn. Well, what does that mean? That, that means that I don't have enough fuel in the ratio of fuel to air. All right? And it's probably causing misfires in the car. And that can happen one of two ways. I either don't have enough fuel, which in the case of the car means I have a fuel injector problem or something like that. Maybe the injectors are dirty and, and the car's not putting enough fuel into the cylinder, so it's too lean to burn. The other thing that can cause that is I have too much air. And I told you earlier, I know what's going on in my car. I have a vacuum leak. And so what that means with the car is, because everything in the cars now is computer controlled, the car measures how much air goes into the intake. And based on the amount of air going into the intake, it adjusts how much fuel the injectors put into the, into the cylinders. So in my case, with this vacuum leak, I've got air coming in after the car has measured how much air it thinks is coming in. What that all boils down to is I've got more air in the cylinder than I'm supposed to have, and my mixture is too lean to burn and it's causing a misfire. All right, the other, the other end of the spectrum is that the mixture can be too rich to burn as well. 
and it's just a flip-flop. So if it's too rich to burn, I've got too much fuel or not enough air. Um, so the same thing happens. Combustion can't occur because the ratio of fuel to air is not right. And when the spark plugs fire and create that ignition source, the third leg of the fire triangle, combustion doesn't happen and I get a misfire in the car. Okay, so you can see how critical these uh, ratios are when it comes to fuel and air mixtures for combustion to be um, successful when an ignition source is introduced. You can look up what the ratio needs to be uh, for just about every flammable vapor that's out there. One place you can look if you have uh, access to it is the NIOSH Pocket Guide, the Silver Manual. Um, but really, just doing a Google search, looking online, you should be able to find out what the proper air and fuel ratio has to be for combustion to occur with just about any flammable vapor. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and flipped over to gasoline in the silver book um, because we are fairly certain that the accelerant that was used uh, in Eric and Gypsy's case was gasoline. That's coming from witness testimony and, and several other things that we know. Um, so we're pretty sure that it's gasoline. And uh, so that's what I've gone ahead and looked. And when you look up these flammable vapors, what you're actually going to find is that, is that there is a range where that ratio of fuel and air will support com combustion. There's a lower limit and an upper limit. With the lower limit, anything, any, any level less than that limit is going to be too lean to burn. Um, and what that limit is describing is the percentage of the volume of the air and, and fuel. So in the case of gasoline, uh, you need 1.4% of the volume in that air-fuel mixture. 1.4% has to be gasoline. Um, in order for combustion to occur. If it's 1.3%, 1.2%, anything less than, than that 1.4% that is going to be too lean to burn. Then it gives you an upper limit. And in the case of gasoline, the upper limit is 7.6%. So the same thing applies. 7.6% of your, of your total volume being gasoline, it'll burn. Uh, you put a spark to it, light a match, whatever, it's going to burn. If it's 7.7%, it's now too rich to burn. There's too much fuel, not enough air. It won't ignite when the spark goes off. So anywhere in between those two numbers, you're in the, you're in the flammability range. You've got the right mixture of fuel to air, and if you add a spark, it's going to burn. All right, so so far we've talked about the fire triangle and the things that are necessary for combustion to occur. You've got to have fuel, you've got to have air, and you've got to have an ignition source. Once combustion starts, you don't need the ignition source anymore because it's, it's there, it's, it's burning. Um, so as long as you continue to have fuel and you continue to have air, combustion will, will continue on. Um, if you take away one of those two things, you take away the fuel or you take away the air, then combustion stops like you saw when I put the jar over the candle. The other thing that, that you've learned so far is that the ratio of fuel to air has to be just right for combustion to occur in normal air at normal pressure. And for gasoline, we talked about the window where combustion is successful uh, and then when it's too lean or it's too rich and combustion won't occur. So how can we use this? We can measure an atmosphere that contains a flammable vapor, which would be fuel, and the amount of free oxygen that's available in that air to determine um, whether or not that fuel-air mixture is in that range where it's ignitable, where combustion can occur. Um, this is frequently done in the fire service and, and in rescue situations where um, someone has to go into a confined space or an unknown atmosphere and, and they don't necessarily know whether it's safe. So one of the things that they will do is they will check uh, to see if 
that atmosphere is in that range where it's ignitable, where it's potentially explosive. And to do that, you use what's called an LEL detector. LEL being the lower explosive limit, that lower number that we looked up in the NIOSH book um, to see what, you know, how um, flammable the gasoline would be in the air based on the concentration in, in that volume of air. Uh, and for gasoline, again, it's 1.4%. So 1.4% of the volume um, has to be gasoline vapors for it to be ignited. So you can use an LEL detector to see how close are you to hitting that 1.4. All right, 1.4 is the lower explosive limit. So 100% of the lower explosive limit for gasoline means it will now ignite. Okay, so what these detectors do, they don't tell you what the volume, what the concentration of gasoline is. They tell you how close are you getting to the 1.4% by volume that will that will support combustion. All right, it's a little bit complicated, but um, those instruments are out there, and the, the fire service, the rescue services, first responders use these on a daily basis. Um, and uh, as far as uh, OSHA is concerned, when you make entry into a confined space uh, for for a rescue or to perform some job. Um, you're, you're supposed to check the atmosphere for various things, and one of those is the LEL. And according to OSHA, if your LEL meter says that it's 10%, all right, so it's still, it's still too lean to burn, right, because we had that discussion, but you're 10% of the way to getting where it will burn. OSHA says if it's 10% or greater, that's a hazardous uh, atmosphere, and you have to wear PPE. You have to have some kind of protection. Um, and, and there are some other SOP type things that you're supposed to do. And the reason for that is, um, like you saw with gasoline, 1.4% uh, of the volume, that's, that's pretty low. Um, and some flammable vapors is even lower. Um, and the, the scariest thing though, um, in a response like that, is it can change dramatically very quickly. So these detectors, typically sound an alarm at 10% to let the operator know you're, you've now hit that OSHA limit and if you don't have the right PPE on, you're going to have to evacuate the area and put that on. Um, but the thing to keep in mind when you're looking at it, an LEL detector, um, it may say 10%, it may say 50%, it may say 75%. That's definitely indicative of a hazard but that's not indicative of an explosive or flammable atmosphere. Only when the LEL detector says 100% are you in an atmosphere um, where combustion can occur. So what we have, this is a multi-ray pro. Um, it's a five gas meter. Lots of fire and rescue services all over the world use this. So in this one, we have an LEL detector, what I've been describing, that will give us the percentage of the lower explosive limit for that flammable vapor that's in our, our atmosphere. Um, alongside that, I have what's called a PID, a photoionization detector. What that one does is it measures um, and quantifies the amount of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, that are in the air. Um, if you pay much attention to, you know, allergies and um, concerns about uh, air quality and that kind of thing, um, you've probably come across the term VOCs. Uh, VOCs occur with just about everything, especially if it's synthetic or man-made. Um, you can't really get away from them. VOCs come out in paint, carpet, um, pretty much everything. The interesting thing about VOCs is they are typically the carrier, or at least one of the carriers, for smell. The things that we can smell with our nose, the reason we can smell them is because they're being carried by VOCs. Um, if you've ever gone in a house or a building after they had carpet put in, and you can smell the carpet, it, you know, the glue, it could just be the smell of the, the new material that's in the carpet, what you're smelling is the VOCs coming off of that. 
Um, they can cause you problems. It is something to pay attention to, um, especially in a hazmat response kind of environment. So that's why uh, these detectors typically have a PID lamp in them. Um, so along with our LEL detector, we have a PID to measure VOCs in this. Um, and this one is also running a carbon monoxide sensor. Um, we're not really going to dive into that. Probably everyone knows what carbon monoxide is. Um, it's just one of the sensors that I have in here um, that's calibrated currently, so um, it's in there. So what we're going to do, we want to use this detector, in particular the LEL detector, to see if the idea, the theory that, that has come up um, in Eric and Gypsy's case actually does make sense. Um, that theory is that we know that Eric went and put gas in his truck um, the Friday night before, around 8 o'clock, he put a few dollars worth of gas in his truck. Um, and sometime between there and noon on Saturday, his truck caught fire and he and Gypsy were burned in the truck. Um, so this, this idea that's been out there, and it's been out there for a while, and it's, it's kind of resurfacing now, is that um, Eric may have lit a cigarette, fell asleep, and dropped it, or something else happened, um, and he dropped this cigarette, and had some gas that had spilled on his, on his boots or maybe on his pants when he was putting gas in his truck, and when he fell asleep or fell unconscious or whatever and dropped the cigarette, that that ignited the gas fumes and caused his entire truck to be engulfed in flames, ultimately killing him and Gypsy. Um, that's, that's the theory that we've heard multiple times. Um, and some of our listeners have heard this theory and they've contacted us about, about it, um, asking us what we think. So we want to use this LEL detector to see if that's plausible. So using the LEL detector gives us a chance to see if the atmosphere in the truck would support combustion because we know all of this science about how fire works and what the upper and lower limits for combustion are with gasoline um, and we have the technology to detect that so that's what we're going to do today we're going to go and see if we can find a, a suitable truck to kind of replicate Eric's and put together a, a, a framework for how we'll conduct this and We'll see what kind of results we get. Okay guys, we found ourselves a truck. It's not exactly like Eric's truck. Eric was driving a 1994 S10 single cab pickup. Um, what we've been able to find and, and get permission to, to do this experiment on is actually a 1993 Chevy Silverado 1500. So it's a little bit larger, especially the interior of the cab. Um, it is a single cab. Um, the upholstery and you know the dashboard and, and all of the stuff that you see inside the cab is pretty much the same um, type material that was used in Eric's truck. Um, the cab's a little bit bigger so the air volume in the cab is going to be a little bit bigger. Um, but we think it's, it's suitable, it works, um, and most importantly it's accessible and we have permission to do that. So here's what we're going to do. We talked about the multi-ray earlier that's got the LEL detector in it and how that works and, and what we would expect to see if there is an explosive atmosphere in the truck. How we're going to do this um, is, is fairly simple. We're going to make an effort to compensate for the excess volume of air in the cab of this truck since we know it's a little bit bigger than Eric's. I don't think we necessarily really have to do that because we know that Eric's driver's side window was rolled down almost halfway. Um, it's still that way today. That's how we know that. Um, and of course, all the glass is out of Eric's truck. Um, we made that determination because everything in the interior is burned away. And you can actually see um, in the driver's side door where the window, the where the glass would have attached to the mechanism that his was actually one that you had to roll. Um, and uh, so we know where his window was at. 
So we may not necessarily have to um, increase the fuel mixture in our experiment to compensate for the extra air volume in the truck we're going to use simply because there was more air volume than one would expect available in Eric's truck because he had a window down. But either way, what we're going to do is we're going to use um, gasoline that has been soaked into a shop towel and is sealed in a mason jar. Right here. So you can just barely see the, a little bit of liquid gas in the bottom of the jar. The, the towel inside is saturated. Got a lid on it. The plan is we will take this jar, put it in the floorboard on the driver's side, take the lid off, we'll have our multi-ray in operation sitting on the driver's seat. Um, so once we take the lid off, we'll shut the door to the cab so that those vapors can build up and we'll watch the screen of the multi-ray through the window and see what the readings are. Um, what we should see is um, almost immediately, because it, it's not freezing outside in Alabama right now, um, almost immediately we should see the VOC readings on the PID lamp going up. Remember, the VOCs are what let us as humans smell things. So if you've ever had to go and fill up your gas jug for your lawnmower and you put it in your car to drive home, you're only in the car for you know three, five, maybe 10 minutes, but it doesn't take long and you can smell the gas um, because it's in there with you. So the same thing's gonna happen in this scenario. We take the lid off, shut the door of the car, those gas vapors are gonna start filtering through the air in the cab of the truck and the VOCs on the multi-ray should start going up. We should see that. If, we, if the explosive nature of that atmosphere or the flammability starts going up, because of those gas vapors, then the LEL detector should also start giving us a reading. When we start, it'll be at zero. Um, and then we're gonna let it sit in there for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes and see what the LEL readings are doing. Um, if at you know 10 or 15 minutes, we're sitting at 60 or 70% LEL, um, then we'll go a little bit longer and see if we we get to the point where it's a 100% reading. Um, because in order for an ignition source of any type to ignite the vapors in the cab of that truck, then the LEL meter is going to have to read 100%. That's the bottom of that range. 100% bottom of the range. There's a whole lot of range of, above that. So if we don't see 100%, it's not flammable yet. It's too lean to burn, just like my car. Um, just to give you an idea, um, so this jar that has the, the shop towel in it, soaked with gasoline, there's 100 milliliters of gasoline in here. Well, how much is 100 milliliters? I live in Alabama and I don't measure things in milliliters. That's 100 milliliters. All right significantly more than you would hope to spill on your boot while you're putting gas in your truck. Um, that's a decent volume. Um, we could increase it. I don't really think it's going to make much difference um, because it's going to it's going to spread through the cab of the truck and we're going to sit there and watch it. Um, so we've got a vehicle. We have a plan. Um, Hopefully you guys understand what we're looking for and why and, and what we expect to see. So let's head out there and uh, set up our experiment and, and see how this goes. All right, guys, we're out here at 82 Auto Parts and Record Service. We're going to do a little experiment here today. See what we think of the idea that Eric may have dropped a cigarette uh, or something happened where he inadvertently would have caught himself on fire um, from some spilled gas on his boots or some other fuel source within the truck. So what we have here today, we've got a 1993 Chevy single cab pickup truck. Um, this is a Silverado 1500 model. Uh, so it, the cab is a little bit larger than what Eric's truck would have been. Um, but the uh, upholstery and stuff inside 
uh, would have been similar. And uh, to compensate for the the size of the cab on this truck, um, what we're going to use is this jar right here. So this is a uh, mason jar that's got a shop towel in it soaked with 100 milliliters of gasoline. Uh, next to it we've got a multi-ray pro um, which is equipped with a lower explosive limit LEL detector along with a photo ionization detector to pick up VOCs. And uh, We're going to hook this up and try it out in this this truck and see if we can get an explosive atmosphere to register on the on the detector so let's see what happens all right so here's our setup We've got the multi-ray position uh, get in close and see if you can actually see it um, we haven't started yet um, so right now the LEL sensor is reading 0% LEL um, the other indications you see on there are carbon monoxide, that's also at zero parts per million. And then VOCs, um, that's volatile organic compounds. Right now it's fluctuating 80, 60 um, parts per billion. Uh, what that's picking up on is um, some of the VOCs that are coming out of the upholstery or uh, other material that is in this truck. It, it could just be that the truck's been sitting for a while. Uh, but as you see, it's it's going down. Um, again, the one we're really interested in is that top reading, the lower explosive uh, limit. And right now it's sitting at zero. Right here in the driver's side floorboard, we've got our mason jar with a shop towel soaked in 100 milliliters of gasoline. And we're going to go ahead and crack the lid on it. And I'm going to shut the door. And we're going to see what kind of readings we get. We're at about five minutes in, um, haven't opened the truck door, everything's still secured. Um, you'll see right now the VOCs are reading just over 20,000 parts per billion. Uh, the CO, carbon monoxide, has come up to 12 parts per million. Um, but the LEL sensor is still reading zero. Um, and again, the uh, VOC readings give us pretty good confidence that the meter is actually picking up the gas fumes. Um, but there's not enough concentration uh, in the air within the cab to even register on the LEL detector. All right, so we're at the 10 minute mark. Uh, again, the cab has remained sealed now for 10 minutes um, with the gas in the floorboard um, off gassing. Our VOC readings right now are 23,000 uh, parts per billion and LEL uh, is still sitting at zero percent. Um, pretty good confidence um, that there is not an explosive atmosphere within the uh, within the cab of the truck. And we're going to let it go a little bit longer and give it a chance and, and see if it ever picks up any readings at all on the LEL detector. Alright, we're at the 15 minute mark, 15 minutes, the cab has been sealed, um, that jar with the gasoline soaked shop towel has been in the floorboard, just off gassing, filling the cab with those fumes. We can see that on the meter, that bottom reading, the VOC reading, is now at just over 25,000 parts per billion. So we know the meter is picking up the gas vapors in the air. The top reading is the LELs, and our LEL is still hovering at zero. It hasn't moved above zero in 15 minutes. All right, so we've got 100 milliliters of gas soaked on a shop towel in the floorboard, putting off some pretty good gas vapors, but sitting in the driver's seat, those LEL readings haven't budged off of zero. So the question could be, what are the levels like where the driver's feet would be down there where the gas actually is? So we're going to go ahead and open up the vehicle and move the meter down to the floorboard and just see what those readings, how they change when we get down closer to the gas. Um, kind of simulating uh, an ignition source like a cigarette being dropped in the floorboard uh, and just see what those readings are and whether or not 
the, uh, the atmosphere, the gases down in the floorboard would actually ignite right now if we were to introduce an ignition source down there next to the, to the jar of gas. So we'll go ahead and do that. Pretty, pretty strong smell of gas in the, in the cab. Got the meter down there, right next to the, to the jar. I don't know if you can see those readings. Still sitting on zero. The VOCs have gone down a good bit, so I'm going to shut the door and leave the meter there. We may not be able to see it on the camera, but. Uh, this meter will alarm, and we'll be able to hear that. All right, so after about five minutes sitting in the floorboard, uh, right next to the, the source of the gasoline vapors, uh, the LEL readings, I know it's hard to see, they're still at 0%, and currently the VOCs down there are a little over 5,000 parts per billion. So those uh, VOC vapors clearly travel upwards. Um, we were getting much higher readings sitting up in the driver's seat. Um, but it is picking up some of the gasoline vapors. But the LEL sensor is still not reacting, not showing anything um, as a result of being next to the gas. All right, so we're at 10 minutes since we moved the detector down into the floorboard. The LELs are still reading 0%, and the VOCs have been bouncing between 6,000 and 8,000 parts per billion. Right now it's reading 7,700 parts per billion on the VOCs. Still after 10 minutes in the floorboard, no readings on the LEL at all. Uh, still sitting at 0%. So we're going to go ahead and open up the vehicle. And let's just see what the detector does when we put it directly over the gas vapors. Right, you hear it alarming already. The LELs are at 62%, still climbing. Sitting around 28, 31%. You see the VOCs are way more now. We're now no longer reading in parts per billion. We're looking at around 200, 200 parts per million on the VOC. So a lot of VOCs at this point. LEL has dropped back down to 13%. I think the highest we saw was about 60%. Remember, that would have to read 100% for those vapors at the lip of the jar to be ignitable. All right, pull it off. I don't want to saturate the detector. Put it back here and let it clear down. I think based on this, we can safely say that uh, the gas vapors in, in the cab of the truck, pretty poor theory. So based on what we saw in the field, uh, the highest LEL readings we were able to get all came from right at the lip of the jar, right at the top but we never saw 100%. And as we've discussed, that LEL reading has to hit 100% so that we know we're in the range where combustion can occur. So unless the LEL says 100%, the mixture is, is too lean to burn. So what we've done is fitted the multi-ray with a flexible probe tip that's gonna allow us to actually put the tip down into the jar so that we can watch the readings and see that the LEL will reach 100% and there is actually a point within the jar where those vapors would be combustible based on the air and fuel mixture.
So we're going to go ahead and take the lid off the jar. And the vapors are probably pressurized. I don't know if you could hear it hiss when I opened it or not. But obviously the vapors were pretty strong when I first opened it. You hear the multi-ray alarming. It's alarming for the VOCs right now. Um, it's reading 300 and some odd parts per million. And you can see that the LEL has actually started going up and I haven't even brought the LEL close. That's just because of the excess vapors that were in the jar. So we're going to let those kind of stabilize first and then we'll try putting the probe down in the jar. All right, now that our readings are stabilized, uh, the LEL sensor is showing 0% and the VOCs have dropped down to about 2,000 parts per billion, um, roughly where we were at the beginning of things in the field. I'm just going to bend this probe over a little bit so that hopefully you can still see the screen. Alright, and there we go. So just below the lip of the jar, you see LEL is flashing at 99% and to the left of it it says over. So just inside the lip of the jar, right about here, is where we hit that sweet spot where combustion could occur. All right guys, so for our last test evolution, not using a truck, but we are going to introduce a cigarette. It's clearly burning. I don't smoke, so I'm using a pump to keep it going. And we're just gonna drop that right into the jar and see if it ignites. still see smoke coming off of it. It's still kind of going in there, but and we're definitely below where the LEL hit 100% on the meter. It's doing a good bit of smoking. There's a good chance that where the cigarette is sitting is actually on the other end of the range and it's too rich to burn down there. And because of the walls of the jar, the gentle breeze that's blowing can't get enough air in there to make the mixture just right. We're going to give it one more go, uh, drop another cigarette in there. Um, I took a moment in between these to uh, go and check on the meter. I don't know if you can still hear it in there beeping. Um, it turns out that the point where we put that probe down into the jar was far enough in there and the vapors were strong enough that we've actually poisoned that LEL sensor and it's going to have to be replaced now. So. Uh, it was reading 99% just below the lip of the jar like you saw, but it was very, very high at that point, probably well above the um, upper explosive limit and at a point where it was 
actually too rich to burn. Um, and as a result of that high concentration of gasoline going into the LEL detector, it's actually burned out now and it's going to have to be replaced. Uh, we'll light a second cigarette here and uh, see if we get any different results. All right. Try number two. All right, so we we got all of that done. Everything I, I think went very well. Um, I'm actually pretty surprised at the results. Um, I'll tell you right now, I never really thought that that scenario was realistic. It doesn't doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. What I'm shocked about is I expected to see readings on the LEL. I, I expected to see 20 or 30 percent at least, on the LEL detector. Just knowing how volatile gas is, I expected that when we shut the door of that truck and the sunlight was coming in, um, so the temperature inside the truck was a little, probably a little bit warmer than it was outside. The wind was blowing a little bit today, so um, I really expected the, the gas papers to show up on the LEL detector and give us some kind of reading. So what does all of this tell us? We go back to the theory that Eric spilled some gas on his shoes, maybe his pants, and then at some point he lights a cigarette, falls asleep, becomes unconscious, drops the cigarette, it ignites the gas fumes, resulting in the fire um, in his truck. Uh, so we can kind of break that down and look at it from multiple angles. First of all, uh, Eric bought gas and he didn't fill up his tank, he just bought a few dollars worth of gas at about 8.03 p.m. that Friday night. Um, we can see him filling his gas uh, tank up. Uh, it doesn't look like he spilled anything. Maybe he did, maybe he got a little splash on him or something like that. Um, 24 minutes later, Eric returns to the store. Parks in front of the store, he's got the driver's side window down, and at one point you actually see the flame from a lighter where he lights a cigarette and he smokes a cigarette inside the cab of his truck 24 minutes after he bought gas. Gasoline doesn't work like a time delayed pill. It, it's not going to become stronger you know an hour later. Uh, if those fumes from spilled gas on his clothing were going to create an explosive atmosphere within the cab of the truck, the kind that would cause a flashover for the entire cab to be engulfed in flame. Uh, that would have occurred when he lit that cigarette 24 minutes later, not an hour or two or however long after that. So you go back to the theory that he fell asleep and he dropped the cigarette and it then it ignited those vapors. Uh, so what we saw today really drives home the almost astronomical odds of that occurring. There would have been a sweet spot where combustion could occur in what we did today. Um, in one of the last segments, you saw the meter sitting on the table next to the open jar. 
uh, and you'll remember it, uh, the, all the reading spiked and I had to let it air out and stabilize for a little bit. And uh, when we came back after it stabilized, the LELs were at 0% and the meter was sitting right outside of the jar. Uh, then we put the probe down in the jar and the LELs went up to 99%. It said over next to that, so we know it was more than 99%. And we definitely know that because we eventually burned the sensor out and I've got to replace it. So inside the jar was too rich to burn. We also know that because you saw video footage of two cigarettes sitting in the jar on top of a shop rag soaked with 100 milliliters of gas, smoke continuing to come out of the jar from the cigarette as it kept burning. And it, you're not going to be able to see it here, but you saw a close-up. That second cigarette actually burned the shop rag that was soaked in gas. So it was burning. But the gas vapors didn't ignite. That tells us that the gas vapors that, are, that were inside of the jar when I put those cigarettes in there was above the upper explosive limit. It was too rich to burn inside the jar. So it was too lean to burn outside the jar, too rich to burn inside the jar. So somewhere in between, we would have hit that sweet spot. Probably if I had balanced the cigarette on the lip of the jar, we might have been able to ignite those fumes and actually see where that range was. We're dealing with 100 milliliters of gas. Significantly more, you saw that in, in the other jar that I showed you, significantly more than you would have likely spilled on your boots or pants. So it's plausible that there was an area in the floorboard on his boot or right next to his boot, wherever that gas was spilled, where the LEL would have been 100% and combustion could have occurred. The question you have to ask is, can an asleep or unconscious person accidentally drop a cigarette and hit that small target area where conditions are perfect to create combustion? Probably not. Just really don't think that, that it would have happened there. So the next question that comes up is, well, what if he dropped the cigarette onto the seat? That's plausible. Uh, seat's a big target. He could have just dropped the, the cigarette there. He's got gas on his boots. It's off gassing in the truck. Well, we, we showed that today as well. Uh, we had the gas in the floorboard, off gassing, meter sitting in the driver's seat, and you saw the VOC readings clearly showing us that the meter could smell the gas, but the LEL never went above zero at that point. So the meter sitting in the driver's seat was far enough away from those gas fumes um, and the, the quantity of air was so great compared to the gasoline vapors that combustion couldn't have, have occurred from dropping a cigarette in the, in the seat. Could something have happened? Would there have been a burn if he dropped the cigarette in the seat? Sure. Uh, most people have seen where a uh, dropped cigarette or the ember from a cigarette has landed on, on upholstery um, and it melts it, creates a burn mark. Um, so that kind of thing, yes, that could have happened. Would it have engulfed the truck in flames and, and burned them to death? Um, not likely. So I think with what we did today, it was a lot of science. It was, it was a lot of information to, to take in. But ultimately, I think we can say that this theory is pretty much garbage. It does seem plausible but highly unlikely and not in the way we're being told. I just don't think it's possible. And I don't think the science, I don't think the, the experiment that we did today gives any indication that that's what happened here. So I appreciate you uh, sticking with me. I know this was a long video. I hope it was informative. Hope you learned something today. If you've got questions, comments, definitely send them our way. You can put them on Facebook, drop them uh, in the comments here on YouTube, uh, and just let us know. And any questions that we're able to answer, we'll definitely get back to you pretty quick. Um, other than that, please keep listening, keep following what we're doing, and uh, keep letting us know that you support us.
Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.